Hello everyone, good afternoon and a warm welcome to the 14th Wallace Inca Center Media Lecture Series, an annual event of the Wallace Inca Center for Investigative Journalism, the WSCIJ. The WSCIJ started this lecture series back in 2008 to foster debate on critical issues affecting Nigeria and the media sector in particular. Since 2009, the organization has held a lecture on 13th July to commemorate the birthday of Africa's first Nobel laureate in literature and the grand patron of the WSCIJ, Professor Wale Shoinka, who is 88 today. So a very happy birthday to Professor Shoinka. We will start with the national anthem. Great. So look, this is the second time we're holding the Wally Shoinka Center Media Lecture Series online. The first was in 2020 because of COVID-19, which of course is still with us. This year's lecture is also significant because it marks the public launch of the Collaborative Media Engagement for Development, Inclusivity and Accountability, or C-Media in short, through the support of our friends at the MacArthur Foundation. So we have plenty to get through this afternoon. Some housekeeping before we start so that we can get the best out of our time together. One, please note that we're recording the lecture and the WSCIJ uh, will share uh, the recording um, once it's ready. 
the hashtag for the lecture is a WS lecture, hashtag um, WS lecture, or um, hashtag 14 WS lecture. That's 14 WS lecture. Actually, let me correct that. The hashtag is actually WSC lecture, and the second hashtag is 14 WSC lecture. So we'd be delighted if you use the hashtags to comment and continue the discussions online, especially for those who cannot be with us uh, this afternoon. We welcome your comments and questions. We'd like you to use the chat or the Q&A section on your screen. I will work these into the panel discussion during the Q&A session. And if you have a question specifically for any of the speakers, the panelists, um, we would like to indicate this by typing their name um, alongside your question. You can also access today's program of events through the link provided in the chat box. Now, the question we're addressing ourselves to for this year's Wallace Inca Center Media Lecture Series is, can democracy work without a strong subnational media? And to set the tone for lecture, I'd like to call on Professor Rokpo Shekoni, who is the chairman of the board of the WSCIJ. Professor, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Hudrak. This is not the professor, it's Mutura Yalaka, Executive Director, CEO Wallace Shrinka Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, Prof is, has not been able to join us yet, so I'll just read um, his prepared speech for this. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to join you today. And um, before we go into the opening speech, first to welcome you all, and then to wish Professor Walishri Inka, who is 88 today, a happy birthday. So greetings to the speakers, panelists, leaders of the press, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good day to you. I welcome you on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Walishri Inka Center for Investigative Journalism to the 14th Walishri Inka Center Media Se Lecture Series Tact can democracy work without subnational, strong subnational media. The first in the series of the Wallishinka Media Lecture Series held in 2008 to examine varying topical issues that have a revibrating re effect on the perceived performance of the media on the. Since 2009, the annual lecture has become a yearly event to celebrate Professor Wallishinka. Africa's first Nobel laureate in literature and Grand Prix of Tron of our organization is 88 today. We celebrate him for his immense contribution to human rights, journalism, and good governance in Nigeria and beyond. Since the maiden edition in 2008, our lecture series has sought to use the platform the media provides to discuss national issues and focus on democracy and the role of the media as a midwife of social justice. The need for electoral reform was at the center stage in 2008. In 2009, we focused on the challenge with the media narrating the Nigerian story with dexterity. At the wake of the rising onslaught of the Boko Haram group in 2012, we focused on security, the clout of fear we saw gathering over the country and how this affected civil liberties. Local government, NANS, Freedom of Information Act, Nigeria's of fortune, vis a vis its social economic realities, taxation and its complexities in a failing social contract situation, the interconnection between poor education and lack of electricity, flaring conflicts based on cultural and ethno-religious differences, the need to rethink credible and, Nig and the Nigerian polity as a viable union have been some of our focus areas in those in other years of this event. Our past, our main speakers are many, as you saw you know, in the slides that was projected just as the meeting started. In 2011, Wallace Shrinker Center for Investigative Journalism brought the issue of subnational governance to the public domain to speak to the issue of democracy, transparency, and accountability at the local government level of the country. Professor Adebayo Lukoshi, along with other speakers, spoke to the theme, 
building democracy, local governance in Nigeria, the imperatives. It was one of our most heated public discussions of an issue which confirmed the urgency of the issue of subnational governance in the federalism. The event was moved entirely, this event was moved entirely online in 2020 due to the pandemic, and this will be the second time we're doing this. This year, the lecture is a virtual one, and we thank you all again for joining. And we hope that you all are able to glean one or two things from it, even as we use this platform as a public launch for the collaborative media engagement for development, inclusion, and accountability, the C Media Project. We're implementing with support from the MacArthur Foundation. And we have 26 partner organizations, many of them who are on this, in this meeting right now, who are working with us on this. In the wake of the lecture, we hope that this lecture will evoke various reactions and conversations around the increase in the subnational reportage and deliberately shed more light on subnational issues. This is especially pertinent in the wake of the upcoming election. Again, I gladly welcome you to this lecture again, and I enjoy you to enjoy the critique and critique the conversations towards encouraging subnational media coverage. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Otunayo, thank you. Um, we thank the good professor, um, even though um, he couldn't make it, um, was able to send through um, those welcoming remarks. So I trust that everyone listening, whether you represent the media, government, diplomatic corps, private sector, civil society, policymaking, academia, that you all feel well and truly welcome to this space. Now we have a distinguished lineup of speakers who will grapple with this issue of the role of a strong subnational media in a democracy, but we'd like you, um, the audience, to grapple with it first. Um, some questions should appear on the screen. Uh, now, um, I'm waiting for them to come up. Uh, if the uh, poll questions could come up on the screen so that the audience can get into this conversation. And we'd love your thoughts on these. Um, you have about three minutes uh, to answer these questions, which are now on your screen. Kindly share your responses. Okay, we should get the responses coming through. The questions we're asking are, one, from which of these media do you get your news? Newspapers and magazines, television, radio, online news sites, or social media? And the second question we're asking is, how often does the media report issues at the state and local government levels? Every day, weekly, regularly, occasionally, rarely? Those are the questions we're asking you. How much longer do we have on the poll? We can probably get on and take the poll. Okay, great. We'll work those responses in. Um, and they've been put in the chat box for you, uh, um, just if you need to reflect further. So we have the benefit of not one, but two keynote speeches, which will be followed by the launch of C Media, which you heard referred to in Professor Shekone's remarks, and then the panel discussion. Our first keynote address comes from the eminent political scientist, Dr. Chi Edo Nwankwo, 
who is the Vice Dean for Education and Academic Affairs at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies or Science. She's joining us um, all the way from Baltimore, I believe. It's early in the morning there. Um, Dr. Wanko's um, career spans roles with the World Bank, Bloomberg Philanthropies, and the Center for Journalism, Development, and Innovation. Dr. Wanko, good morning and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, so, good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this crucial discussion on the role of the subnational media in democracy building in Nigeria. Um, I would like to also commend uh, your foresight in creating this organization, the Walesha Inca Center for Investigative Journalism, and the wonderful work you do down in the trenches to facilitate the building of a vibrant and independent media in Nigeria. Uh, happy birthday to you, Prof. Wole Shoinka. So in considering the question for today's uh, uh, lecture talk, which ponders the possibility of building a vibrant democracy um, without independent media playing the watchdog role at the subnational level? Let's be clear that the focus here is on democracy and the media is but a subset. Nevertheless, it is one that when absent, renders democracy unworkable. And so um, I'm sure the direction I am headed in answering this question um, of whether democracy can work without a strong national media is pretty clear at this point. To engage this debate, allow me to submit two core propositions. One, is that democracy is at its core, a human development project. The second core pro proposition is that the media is fundamentally a democracy project. So to assess this question before us today, I will use these two core propositions I submitted as heuristics. I will briefly examine what we mean by democracy in this context and what the media does or ought to do. What do we mean by democracy? Democracy here does not entail its abstract philosophical and theoretical renderings, but embraces it as a living reality. And that living reality is development. Democracy is essentially a framework for development, right? Uh, to self-actualize, to self-realize. And based on the United Nations Global Compact, right, the SDGs, uh, these have become the markers for development. So democracy implicates the issues of development, the issues of man and society that we face today, right? Issues of health, gender equality, education, and so on. And so democracy here is not abstract, normative, um, theoretical, uh, neither is it uh, of its philosophical imaginary. Rather, it is the everyday lived realities of citizens. Without democracy, life's chances become significantly constrained. And you know, um, I know that within the larger theory, the literature, that there's a debate, right? Um, the debate is ongoing. It will keep going, uh, ongoing as far as long as um, society remains. Um, but those of us um, in this side of the debate are strongly persuaded, right? And we do have um, proof, empirical proof, that life's chances become significantly constrained in the absence of democracy. Uh, in principle, and um, empirically also, democracy provides a remedy for the ills of societies, mostly developing societies, right? As it is at this time, at this time of you know, global progression. Um, colonialism, military rule, inattentive and self-interested leadership, right? So democracy, that is the substantive variant of democracy, is the most realistic solution to these issues of society. It is, however, not a magic bullet, as we all know. All right, so now that we have established that democracy is key to life, right? Or the kind of life we all aspire to as citizens, then what role do 
Wikipedia is critical to a strong democracy and democracy is key to development. The problem or disconnect, if you will, is the tendency of journalists to divorce democracy from development. Because as noted earlier, journalism is a democratic project. So having made this case for democracy as the push we need to establish life and media as implicated in democracy, the next step is then to make the case for how the media plays a major role in establishing uh, or establishment of democracy. I will look at three main ways it does this, or it should do this, right? At the heart of journalism is the accountability motif, right? While not the only mechanism of establishing accountability, the media is the most effective. It is documented in case laws, statutes, and treaties, right? For example, in section 22 of our own constitution in Nigeria. The media's sustained pressure for accountability on governments often drive transparency and government responsiveness. As Laclo aptly puts it, there is democracy as long as there exists the possibility of an unlimited questioning. Second, the second role um, the media should play right, in democracy is the agenda setting role. Issues that affect people are normally right, heading to agents of government, the executive, folks in the legislative chambers of government, people in the judiciary, right, businesses, et cetera. We need a mechanism that aggregates and articulates these interests in nonpartisan ways and translates them into sets and sequences of policy and programmatic imperatives for the government. And in so doing, sets the agenda for development. This agenda setting role of the media is crucial, not only for the substantive and active framing of issues, but also for its peculiar role of amplifying the people's voices as they seek to assess the dividends of democracy and lay claims on the state. For example, right, um, flooding incidents in a community would escape the attention of agents of government, but for the media. It could also be that you know, they access spotlight and, and spotlight uh, a brewing or active conflict um, in this community or and a cholera outbreak in the other community, all of which have implications for policy and programmatic engagement, in this case, right, around human security. It could equally be calling citizens' attention to the policies governments are making and how these policies implicate or impact people's lives. It could also be the highlighting the fact that women from this or that community are playing significant roles in state building. The point is that the media is the one institution that is created and takes on this specific job of agenda setting. Number three, <clears throat> the media regulates how these processes of state then works, right? That is a standard setting. Society is structured into levels of governance, federal, state, and local government. But here is where the rubber meets the road. Everybody is focused on dealing with the national government, right? Not enough people are dealing with the state, and certainly nobody is dealing with the local government which has become a plane of chaos with grave implications for citizens, considering that effective and efficient government and governance has to be local. So how do we build a subnational media engagement? What do I recommend? I am essentially advocating for a rethinking of media engagement regarding its predilection towards the national, right? In real terms, I am advocating for a focus and expansion on community radio. And we can achieve this through several ways. Um, one, we need to reorient journalism schools to help make this point clear. Um, two, there is need to engage with regulatory institutions to make this possible. As we all know here in Nigeria, community radios are anachronistic these days, right? Uh, the few university radio sections, uh, stations we have are essentially locked up in offices of the vice chancellors. We need community radios 
we need them to offer farm information, health information, weather information, disseminate early warning, early response information in the case of conflict, provide entertainment to local communities, and so on. The Nigeria Broadcasting Corporation has to wake up to its responsibilities here, right, and has to depoliticize like the issuance of licenses, particularly community radios, uh, licenses for co community radios, and also not at the current exorbitant prices. The current practice clearly is counterproductive. But we also need to engage newspapers. We need these dailies or weeklies, as the case might be, to hold the state and local government administrators accountable. So the question that this occasion asks is, can democracy work without a strong subnational media? The answer is an emphatic no. For example, a lot has been ascribed to the resilience of democracy in India, just to the fecundity, the, the ubiquity of community media in India. There is no existence of democracy without a strong media not at the subnational level or any other level of governance for that matter. So journalism training has to be dynamic. It is possible to establish profitable media at the subnational level, right? Which is typically the excuse the, uh, for the absence of subnational, strong subnational media. Because journalism schools are not paying attention to the issue of innovation in media, and indeed, which is at the heart of sustainability of the media, the fourth eight states continues in this erroneous and in fact damaging belief that community media does not lend itself, neither can it be engineered to provide a sustainable funding stream. Design thinking in media innovation has validated the existence of media models that drive sustainable development while simultaneously generating resources for self-sustainability. So as the Wallace Shoyinka Center for Investigative Journalism publicly launches the collaborative media engagement for development, inclusivity, and accountability, the C media, and sets the agenda for media design thinking, one hopes that the innovativeness of this initiative and its compelling rationale will draw partnership from both public, private, and not for government sectors towards accomplishing its goals. In conclusion, if we cannot build sustainable media models, then we cannot have a thriving democracy. And in the absence of that, development will continue to be elusive and will continue to wait for God. But initiatives like the C Media clearly make it um, clear that, that we are headed in the right direction. And Nigeria is work in progress. But I'm certain that if not in my generation, that my children will enjoy the generation, our children will enjoy times and periods of strong democracy and the, also enjoy the dividends of democracy in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Dr. Mwako, thank you, um, you know, for that unpacking, but also the hopeful and optimistic note that you leave us on. Um, I'm a self-confessed cynic myself. Um, whether it's from my Kenyan side or the Nigerian side. So um, you leave with a lot of hope for both countries. Uh, so um, everyone, you have noticed that we promised you Dr. Kole Shatima from the MacArthur Foundation. He sends his apologies, he's stuck traveling. And so he has sent us his very able uh, deputy, uh, Dayo Olaide, who comes to us, you know, with a wide range of expertise spanning government, media, civil society, and academics. He is the di deputy director of MacArthur Foundation's Africa offices um, uh, based in Nigeria. So, um, Dayo, you're welcome. Thank you, um, Udwak. And um, let me also join um, Chiedo and all of the uh, participants online to also see, uh, send a very big happy birthday to uh, Professor Wallace Winka. And at the same time, to also quickly uh, congratulate uh, Wallace Winka Center for uh, Investigative Journalism for this uh, dialogue. Um, let me quickly make a confession. So um, I'm going to ramble through my notes, 
right? And that's because, that's because I was only conscripted into this conversation just this morning. Um, but the good thing, however, this morning is uh, Professor Mwako has done an excellent work laying the foundation and setting the, the, the uh, I think, a critical and foundational understanding of democracy and the connection with um, uh, journalism. So I'll, I'll try to, to, to just build on that. And a lot of what I'll be sharing this afternoon um, are more practical. Um, and when I say practical, and that's because I'm a practitioner. So um, I'll be speaking as a program person who every day have to review proposals and think about strategies um, to enhance the role of the media and journalism broadly um, in the democratic um, in the democratic um, uh, experiment, um, as it were. I think my first point will also be to answer the headline question, which is that where is democracy without uh, the role, without a subnational uh, media organization? I think just like um, uh, my um, uh, prof said it's a no uh, it's a no answer without a strong functional um, subnational uh, 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 journalism practice it's practically impossible for us to be able to have a democracy that is able to deliver dividends uh, uh, and you know uh, deliver good public good uh, to to the, uh, to the Nigerian people or to uh, the, the population uh, broadly. Now, having said that, the key point here that I would like to start with is the fact that in a place like Nigeria, as we have seen globally, it is acknowledged that democracy is facing hum um, a lot of human and institutional challenges. Now, what we have seen in the last two decades, however, is that in spite of these challenges, the oversight or watchdog role of the media, however, seems to have been invested and more vested at national level. The implication is that a significant part of what represents the Nigerian space is left um, underreported or even completely unreported at all. Now, for anyone who is very familiar with our democracy, uh, the Nigerian federal system, you realize that between 50 and 52% of annual spending in Nigeria actually goes to the, state, to the state and local government level. What that suggests is that a significant part of what is spent and what should go into development, right, should be delivered at the subnational level. And so our failure in the last two decades to be able to pay adequate attention to where the 52% of our annual spending goes to is partly responsible for the underdevelopment that we are seeing at the state, at the state and local government level. And I think this ties in very um, squarely to what um, you know, my uh, previous, this, the previous speaker said, that whereas democracy can be seen as the pathway to, to development. Uh, the journalism on the other hand, right, is a project. So you might say that journalism serves as that catalyst to bring about the, the uh, you know, to activate uh, the capability of democracy to deliver, to deliver development through those three, uh, those three roles that uh, the previous speaker identified. Um, as gatekeepers, as standard setting, but also as agenda setting. Now, if we are seeing this failure at the state level, uh, in, uh, uh, in the case of Nigeria, a number of things I think quickly explain that. It, first and foremost is the complexity of the Nigerian space and, and the complexity of the Nigerian uh, federal, federal uh, structure, which I, I just talked about. I think we must also acknowledge that Nigeria uh, like several other developing uh, uh, countries, um, has a predominantly illiterate and uneducated society. We equally have a deeply unaccountable political class um, 
Related to that is a significantly compromised and weak um, official public oversight and regulatory uh, bodies at federal, at state, and local government levels. Then we also then have a highly politicized governance culture where ethnic, religious affiliations, and other types of affiliations, you know, often drive uh, development planning and development uh, uh, spending. Now, there is, there is also the issue of widespread insecurity and impunity that you find at both federal and state and the local government level. Now, these for me represent some of the critical complexities that Nigeria presents to anyone um, studying it. But add to this also the challenges that is facing the media in its, you know, um, as well. And top of the challenge facing the media is the funding challenge. So that today, when we talk about you know, the, the, the uh, media being able to play its role, funding stands um, as a major impediment. Related to that is also this very close nexus or proximity between the media and government so that the media is critically and dangerously dependent on state patronage for survival. Um, then you also have you know, the, low invest the, the low investment in investigative work that you find across media organi or, um, organizations. I've also talked about the state capture of the media space. Now, what we have seen in particular since Nigeria's return to democracy is that a a practically every politician wants to have a media license, a radio license, a TV license. And so there is a deliberate and intentional but gradual process of capturing uh, the media space. Then the final point, you know, in terms of the, the challenges facing the media uh, to play in its role is the overbearing regulation, regulation and, regu uh, and regulatory uh, rules that you find in place. That now makes it easy for the media to rather self-censor than, you know, violate, um, th th than violate rules. The implication of all of this, therefore, is that for uh, democracy to be able to deliver its, uh, to be able to deliver development to a significant uh, proportion of the Nigerian people and in any democracy, indeed, we need to be able, not only for the, for the media to continue to pay attention to, uh, to the federal government uh, or the central government, but begins to extend the same focus, uh, the same level of attention to what is happening at the um, sub-national level. Now, a couple of things can happen for this. Uh, we, can, we can think about a couple of things to make this happen. I think some of them, um, uh, uh, Professor Wako already talked about, which is that the regulatory body needs to rediscover itself. Its role, it's, to, it's not only to regulate um, the media, but rather to put in place policies that enables the media to play the civic education role. I think right now, um, a lot of the regulatory bodies that you find in Nigeria and in several uh, and, and in many other places, uh, I've been I've been reminded that uh, my my time is up. But I, I mean, I hope that I'll be able to talk about some of the things that that I uh, that I um, that we can do, uh, you know, to be able to address um, some of these uh, challenges during the QRD. Actually, please, please, please complete your thought. You, you want a powerful thought about uh, media regulation. Please, please finish your thoughts about um, what we can do going forward. So, uh, thank you, Uduak. So my, my very uh, first point is to say that the regulatory bodies have a critical role to play in this, in this, uh, in this instance, that they must shift from a punitive controlling uh, mindset to one that is uh, that is more more partnership oriented to enable the, the media uh, actually play the civic education role um, as a platform for actually educating the public but also creating democrats um, i think that is one one major uh, re uh, responsibility of the regulatory bodies that has been left unattended to. The second point, um, you, you know, um, if, I, if I may, is to say that, yes, we have seen 
you know, more donor uh, organizations come into the space. But there is nowhere in the world where donor organizations have been the one providing the sustainable support to media organizations. I think we need to get more Nigerians investing in protecting and strengthening the media because of the critical role it plays, but also the value that it adds to democratization and development in the uh, short, medium uh, to, 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 uh, to, the, to the long run. And then the final point and, um, to make here is the role that corporate bodies should play in this, in this instance. I think that um, corporate bodies, we can argue, have probably been too laid back uh, for several reasons. Uh, of course, they are mostly hands in glove with, with government. And so would rather stay clear of media organizations. But I think that given the threat that the complete absence of a vigilant and strong media organization can pose to democracy and the damage that can have on business ultimately, I think we need to start making the case for corporate bodies to invest more uh, in the in the uh, media media business. I'll stop there. Thank you so much once again, uh, Udwa. Daya, thank you, thank you so very much. This this has worked really well because we got a high level view from Dr. Wanko, and then you brought it home from us. I mean, um, for us uh, from the perspective. Um, of a practitioner, but also someone who sits on the grant making side. So thank you very much. And as Sarah says, brilliant. It's completely um, brilliant. So look, if you're just joining us, welcome. This is the 14th Polish Oyenka Center Media Lecture Series. And just heard brilliant interventions addressing the question of whether democracy can work without a strong subnational media. The answer was an emphatic no. We will now turn our attention to the Collaborative Media Engagement for Development, Inclusivity and Accountability, or C-Media, which we're about to launch. C-Media is supported by the MacArthur Foundation, and we just heard from their Deputy Africa Director. It's a multi-level intervention for media, um, which um, you know, uh, advances media independence, sub-national government accountability, private sector transparency, and amplifies marginalized voices. And it's run by the WSCIJ, our hosts this afternoon. Uh, I'll invite Motun Rayo Alaka, this time officially, the executive director at WSCIJ to launch C Media. Motun Rayo, welcome back. Thank you so much, Udrak. And I must thank uh, Dr. Chido for and uh, Mr. Dayo Olaide for laying the foundation for the discussion. Um, I'll just take us through very quickly what the C Media project in full. It is collaborative media engagement for development, inclusivity, and accountability is about. Uh, we started it in the beginning of this year. Um, it is for us a build up to the things that we have been very passionate about over the years and that we continue to consider um, important as we collaborate with other partners in this space to build um, the media that we want and also be able to, to build the country that we want through that. So uh, we're just sharing a screen quickly to go through um, what the C-Media project is about. Um, this quote comes to mind about uh, from Dr. Nelson, from Nelson Mandela, which says that a critical, independent, and investigative press is the lifeblood of any democracy. The press must be free from state interference. It must have the economic strength to stand up to the blandishment of government officials. It must have sufficient independence from vested interests to be bold and inquiring about fear without fear or favor. It must enjoy the protection of the constitution so that it can protect our rights as citizens. This of course is, is the ideal that we continue to push the Nigerian media and indeed media um, around the world to so that democracy can deliver on what it promised to the people. So this is the collaborative media project. Um, the C-Media project, it is multi-level. Uh, it is multi-level in that we're looking at government, 
uh, the federal government, but more critically the state and the local government, which, um, you know, as we have heard, don't get enough coverage. And how do we mean don't get enough coverage? So in the most of our major media houses are focused on national. And for instance, I've asked for many years, you know, why don't we have a newspaper focused just on Lagos, as big as Lagos is, and as uh, important to the national conversation that it is. Why do not do we not have a newspaper, you know, that is just focused on Ogun State? Why don't we have a newspaper focused on Inugu? Or why don't we have a radio station that only does those are not are not just reporting from the side of being a government media because we have that in many of these spaces, but reporting as independent media. So we want to look at the public sector, we want to look at the private sector, we want to look at people. We also find that minority groups, me, women, youths, you know, persons with disability, uh, people who live in interlands, you know, do not get enough coverage or do not, we do not hear their voices enough as sources of news. And then we want to focus on issues, issues of accountability, issues of media independence, issues of you know, governance and then issues of investigative stories. We want to also be able to do investigative stories. And one of the things that we are sure that focusing on the subnational would help us to do is to do that role of the media of informing and secondly, and more importantly, of educating. Um, we often look at the institutions like the academia that are, you know, in the business of educating, but the media has a strong role to educate in such a way that, you know, the people's civic side can come up. People understand the issues they are engaging and they are able to engage with nuance and, you know, in context. So uh, we're also hoping that, you know, more media houses begin to educate people. Um, to the next slide, we are partnering with 26 organizations, supporting with funds, uh, these 26 organizations, you will see the names of the organizations soon. And what we are hoping that, like um, Mr. Dio, like this is an invention, and that after three years of support, many of these organizations will be strong enough to stand on their own, raise their own funds through the various you know, models that we have for media sustainability and be able to continue the work. We are supporting individual and collaborative projects um, so that um, when, for instance, a media house, one of our partners or any other media house reports an issue that is in an interland, somebody who is in the middle of the city with other platforms uh, like the digitally enhanced social platforms can then go ahead and republish the stories. And this story Want to build the capacities of the media houses technically, and we are also building them um, organizationally, and we're helping them also with their reportage. We want to amplify the voices of those we do not hear enough of in the media. Um, personally, I think that our front pages is often filled with, you know, um, elected officers. We need to hear more and see more from the people who the media serve. We want to be able to also lead conversations like the one we are doing today, because we believe that conversations are about learning. We can learn from one another. We can learn about other things that have happened in other countries and how we can grow our media and make it more sustainable in Nigeria. If we recall the COVID-19 period was a period where, you know, we just saw for ourselves that, you know, the media might not be able to survive if it gets hit with you know, that kind of pandemic again. Of course, it's not just the Nigerian media, it is the global media, but the issue of sustainability of the media then becomes a question that we must continue to ask ourselves because without the media, the democracy will suffer. And of course, we also want to be able to defend the rights of the media. Um, lately, you know, the government has tried so strongly and even, you know, people generally, when an era where debates are not quite welcome, people want to say what they want to say and move on. We want to be able to, to help our partners to remain safe because uh, one of the things that we're finding is that proximity is a reason that subnational media does not grow. And I mean proximity to the government that you are 
that you are uh, scrutinizing or criticizing. Um, easily, government can send you know, their security officials to pick journalists up when they are in the same state, uh, rather than when you know, it's at a federal level and there's more attention. And then finally, it's just to ask, these are the media partners that we have, 26 of them. Uh, I will not be able to call all their names, but uh, when you check the, the link that we will post to the website, you would see all the organization. And MacArthur is our partner on this. And then finally, just to ask that you join in to support um, this drive to ensure that you know, Nigeria generally gets the media coverage that um, it wants. We want you to join in, in the conversation that we will be holding online. Um, join in partnering with these media organizations at different levels, uh, help to share the story so that the issues of accountability and the issues of good governance and really making Nigeria a place that is suitable for the vulnerable to thrive in uh, becomes something that we can also see hopefully in our lifetime. So um, again, join us as we build this together. Thank you. Thank you, Mutun Rayo, and congratulations um, on the launch of the C Media Initiative. Congratulations on today's lecture and congratulations on the hard work you've been doing uh, over the years. You're going from strength to strength and we look forward to seeing um, what more you'll be able to achieve for um, not just Nigeria's media, but the media um, as a whole. Now, we will continue our exploration of the role of subnational media in a vibrant and thriving democracy, this time with our distinguished panelists. <clears throat> Starting with Abiba, Don Pedro, who's the managing director of National Point. She has um, spent over 30 years as a reporter and researcher uh, she authored Trapped in the Barrel, a subnational investigative report on the consequences of oil exploration on women in the oil producing communities. Uh, she's also um, a winner of the 2003 Cable Net uh, CNN African Journalist of the, of the Year Award. Uh, she publishes National Point, which is a, a Niger Delta focused news publication. Also with us is uh, Haruna Mohammed, who is the co-publisher of Wiki Times, he's the editor and head of investigations. Uh, in addition to investigative journalism, Haruna is a passionate social activist and a community development volunteer who planned and executed community development projects in Bauchi and Kano State. Through his work, he's inspired donors to renovate schools in Bauchi State. We have Fisaya Soyombo, the founder and editor in chief. Of, and of the Foundation for Investigative Journalism and Social Justice. Fisayo is an investigative, investigative journalist, as many of you know. He's a three-time winner of the Wale Shoenka Award for Investigative Reporting and a 2222 Fellow of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. You'll join me in welcoming Adora Onyechere, who's the Executive Director uh, for Gender Strategy Advancement International. Through her Women Enabling Women Everywhere network, indigenous brands are profiled, pitched, and content developed using mainstream media. She's also a talk, a talk show host on KISS 99 FM, where social in, uh, issues and the gap between policymakers and citizens are discussed. And last but not least, um, and so you'll have to tell me whether you're there. Um, it would be a pleasure to see you. We haven't seen each other since we both left the BBC. Um, this is Mansour Liman, the Director General of the Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria. Um, as you've heard me say, he is a, a former journalist with the BBC and he's credited with helping the BBC achieve its responsive design technology and improve the user experience of its bbchausa.com via mobile phones. And so ladies and gentlemen, my first question to you is the question that we've been considering. We've heard from the keynote speak, uh, speakers, you know, who say that um, democracy cannot work, cannot thrive, cannot be vibrant 
without um, a, 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 a functioning subnational media. My question to you from your perspectives as practitioners is the same question. Can democracy work without a strong subnational media? And I'll start with Ibiba. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, I guess we're all clear about the reality that democracy cannot work without strong, uh, independent, um, thriving uh, subnational media. As, um, I'm managing director of National Point Newspaper, a publication run by two women. The only uh, such publication I imagine in the country. We all started, myself and Constance Meju, we started off as um, mainstream journalists. Constance has the experience in um, radio and she was the first female um, editor of um, Sunray newspaper, a, a thriving well-funded newspaper uh, that covers the Niger Delta mainstream, but unfortunately crashed, much like what happened with Next, those of you who, be, who follow media. Um, we decided to set up National Point for these very reasons uh, we've been talking about all day. Um, having started with um, The Guardian, we realized, I, I personally realized that the issues of the people of the Niger Delta, the Ogun, you know about the Ogoni crisis, I got into uh, the media in 1993 in the thick of the June 12 elections about that period. And then there was the Ogoni crisis, the killing of Sarowiwa. Um, I got, I, I would travel from Lagos and go to communities where there's been um, an oil spill and the ordinary people, community members, women will have their fishing areas, their farms destroyed. And there they will be just complaining, but moaning, without any real response from either the state governments or the oil companies themselves. That was how National Point um, got burned. And we're still there doing what we have to do. Shutting off um, or, or uh, not giving support to, um, to, to, to regional media like The Guardian and so many of the others, uh, the ones in the Southwest, in the North, the Northeast, the Central and all, will mean simply shutting out the voices and killing the aspirations for freedom, for development of millions of um, Nigerians. Because this sub uh, the totality of the subnational media is what makes up the media as we know it. Every, every news, uh, news ultimately is local. So you need strong media, staying the cause, keeping all, all, all with the issues. I do remember going from the Guardian to say, Ogoni, or maybe somewhere in Bielsa. And unfortunately, I would just go there and then just do a report and dash back to Lagos. And because of funding constraints, um, as, as um, benevolent or as um, committed as the Guardian was, then, because the Guardian today, I know, doesn't have, doesn't do the kind of investigative, uh, fund the kind of investigative report, reports when I was there that and enabled me win all the awards, including the CNN awards, met Nelson Mandela, met anybody you can imagine, Obama and all of that. Those resources are not there. We need the kind of work we're doing today with the collaborative media. Without that, even living here in Port Harcourt, it would be difficult for me to travel, to um, hire a boat to a river right area to do a report and then go back. Uh, in May, um, we were in Sangana by Elsa, where there was a, a gas blowout at, a, at an offshore facility owned by um, Cornwall. We are, we are going back there. We are able to do that because we have this support. But I do realize that, you know, I remember I spoke with uh, Dr. Shetima in December when this whole thing started. And I, I, mentioned, I remember mentioning to him that we at National Point are trying to be realistic. We realize that we cannot do it alone. We cannot depend on grants alone. We need to we need to fund, set up, you know, support businesses, including going into agri. That's where we are, In, including you know we have a, 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 a magazine that's supposed to be a quarterly, which we're hoping um, to. We already we had the first edition in 2020, and 
we were unfortunately because magazine publication, a full color uh, publication, it's, we're talking about millions, but we intend to go into all of that because the Niger Delta matters. The Niger Delta people matter, the women, okay. persons with disability, people who don't have a voice, persons who are, who are left alone to battle powerful oil companies who destroy their environment, their, matter, their, their issues matter. And we're not going away because we're passionate and we're trained journalists. I hear, your, I, I hear your passion. This is, uh, we've just started and you've laid the groundwork for us beautifully. And so I'm going to shift my opening question for the rest of uh, the panelists. Um, because if we all agree, and I think we're preaching to the choir here, that um, democracy cannot function without a strong media, a strong subnational media. And so my question to the rest of the panelists and um, Harun, I believe you're next, um, is how do you ensure that your efforts are sustainable? We've heard about funding constraints. Abib has talked at length um, about it. Um, and we're hearing a lot about you know, media relying on grants. But Dayo earlier made the point that um, funding coming from donors is not sustainable. So how do you ensure that, the, uh, you know, that what you're running, that your efforts within the media space are sustainable. Thank you. Well, um, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, quickly, before I answer your question, uh, for a typical villager like me, whenever a conversation about our democracy and its challenges erupts, I pause for a moment and what I usually do to get a sense of what people talk about is to mirror my entire community uh, within the milieu of the ongoing conversation. And for me, uh, many a times, uh, a lot of questions bubble in my mind, which are that here is a community, for example, that lacks functional primary healthcare facility to treat the simplest of illness you could think of. People travel several kilometers to access healthcare services. And in their effort to do that, they are confronted by other myriads of challenges, such as bathrooms, for example. In my community, women die on the road, you know, in their effort to get transported to the hospital during child labor. School age children in my community, for example, don't get to school because um, the government has not provided a single classroom block. And of course, with security breaches all over, parents cannot risk allowing their children to trek for several kilometers, you know, just to access school in the neighboring community. Again, uh, you know, whenever a conversation about our democracy, you know, uh, is put on the table, uh, I also look at my village trying to understand why people get worried. When you wake up every morning and what you see is your fellow villagers competing, for example, to produce children, on plant children, and later on leash them, you know, on the street to beg as almajiris. When what you see every day is collapsing infrastructure, high unemployment, poverty, misery, despair, then you come to the conclusion that we are in trouble. And for me, this, few striking characteristics define my village and at the heart of these challenges whenever one ponders deeply lies two things information and knowledge and i want to use information and knowledge for example to answer your question uh, directly uh, because as a journalist i do know that my village what my village requires for example to wither the storm and breast up for meaningful development is nothing but the right information and the right knowledge. Of course, like Professor Wanko uh, would concede, the keynote speaker, uh, my village needs the right information and knowledge because when people are well informed, the kind of decision they make is usually driven by knowledge and the outcome more than likely would be a positive one. I also know, for example, uh, that uh, Moturayo and the rest of the members of the audience will also concede that at the heart of information and knowledge lies the place of the media. And not just the media, but a very strong and viable media. 
So for me, conversation about our democracy and what it is capable of bringing to the table depends solely on whether we have strong media institutions that have the commensurate capacity to tell truth to power and hold leaders to account, and particularly at the subnational level. So what gets me worried most of the time is that our media institutions, particularly at local levels, are evidently weak, lacking in knowledge, lacking in capacity to do the needful. Now, to answer your question directly on whether uh, as a media platform, how, how do we get sustained after the kind of fundings we receive stopped? Uh, a lot of people, for example, talk about donor fatigue. Whether we like it or not, this is a conversation we have to bring to the table. This is a conversation we have to consistently talk about because organizations like MacArthur, like Ford Foundation, will not forever be funding the kind of journalism we do. So the key question is, what do we do to sustain the brand of journalism we are doing that is at the moment supported by WSAIG, by MacArthur and the rest of the organization? So for me, there are a number of things. Apart from investing or deliberately making effort, like uh, Dr. Oladayo has said, to get the private sector, to get people involved to do, for example, subscription, uh, you know, uh, like many other people are suggesting, uh, to get people buy to the, the, the kind of journalism we are doing. As media owners, as media practitioners, we also have to make deliberate effort to enhance our capacity, to build our capacity, because we will only do serious adversarial journalism when we have commensurate knowledge, commensurate expertise, commensurate capacity to be able to hold power to account. At the subnational level, for example, where I work, even though there are a number of radio stations, both government and, and, and private on media outfit, but go try and assess their capacity, their capacity to even identify red flags identify corruption and be able to report authoritatively and convincingly that it is in our individual and collective interest world government to account. How many of them, for example, have that kind of capacity, that kind of knowledge? So we need to make deliberate effort to invest in building the capacity of journalists in consistent collaborations, partnerships, networking, and all that. So in addition to other alternative means of funding that we should consistently decipher on, we also need to make effort to sustain the kind of partnership we are forging, to sustain the kind of collaboration we are forging, and from all fronts, both in our effort, for example, like I said, to build our individual uh, capacities, of course, we also need to do a number of things. Okay, Haruna, I'll allow you to come to those things that you need to do um, a bit later. Um, that works in terms of, you know, laying out your perspective. Um, I'd also like to uh, take this uh, opportunity to recognize the president, uh, to recognize the presence of Professor um, Rupo Shekoni, who's joined us. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, we heard your remarks earlier. And we look forward to hearing from you um, as we close this uh, event. So Fisayo, I'm coming to you now because you know we, we've heard about funding constraints from Haruna and Abiba, but we've also heard about the dire poverty that their communities find themselves in, illustrated to, you know, they've been very graphic um, in, in the illustration of what they see around them. So Fisayo, you're an investigative journalist, whether you're in Nigeria, whether you're in Kenya, Governments typically respond to the efforts of international journalists, uh, in investigative journalism with, you know, this is the work of enemies. And usually these, this is, you know, sponsored by people coming from outside the country. Wow. So even though we see people like yourselves, um, you know, John Allen Namu in Kenya, um, uh, you know, the, the young man in uh, Ghana, um, you know, investigating, exposing rot, within our societies, um, your credibility is always, you know, tussled over. 
So how do you ensure that your efforts as a, an investigative journalist are both credible, but also locally sustained? You're muted, I believe. I can't hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Please permit me to divide my five minutes into two, two, two minutes to just um, touch on something I think is also Go important ahead. that Go maybe ahead. has not been said. Okay. And, you know, that is the fact that, you know, the problem of uh, media has been spoken about. But I'm very worried that the people do not know their rights as it concerns subnational governments, states and local governments. So it's not just that the media is not, is not covering it well enough, it's that it is so bad that people don't even know what to do, who to turn to, who to blame when things are going wrong. And I'll quickly give two examples. One is a recurring example, one is a current example. There was um, an incident of flooding in Lagos some days back and there were casualties. And someone told me, oh, this APC government, and the person did not even know that it's the job of a local government to maintain street roads, to have good drainages. And that when you have problems of flooding, for example, it's not even the, the problem of the federal government that the media is so focused on, you know, that's the, the current, the recurring. Someone told me just yesterday, oh, uh, it looks like courses get uh, uprooted at a symmetry in Ibadan, Songo symmetry. And then um, we have to get the government to, well, that's the job of a local government. You know, a local government is supposed to be the closest unit of governance to the people. And it is the job of a local government to provide things like public toilets, to maintain symmetries, to create symmetries. If you have symmetries that are full, get new ones. The ones that are there, maintain them. So there are quite a number of things that the people don't know. You know, and when the public are in the dark as to their rights, then political office holders get away. Because apart from the media, there are people that citizens ought to hold the government to account. But when citizens don't even know where to go to local government or what individual in the local government system they should turn to, then the problem is, is really big. So it's a big issue that we are, we are, we are discussing today. Now to answer your question, what can the journalists do to enhance their credibility no, 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 in the life of the question. kind of investigative. investigative journalists to enhance their credibility? The first is that there should be no loopholes in your story as an investigative journalist. You know, so you can have opinions, you can have, but if you are putting out a work as one of investigation, then it should be foolproof. No one can pick any hole in it. That's one. Two is that all sides have to be covered. You have to reach to the other side and say, most times, government officials would not like to talk. But then it's clear if I gave you the opportunity to explain, despite my findings, you can't say that I'm working for an international body, I'm working for your, for, for your political uh, opponents. Those points will always come, but the response from, from the journalists is that, yeah, I, you had the opportunity um, to, to, to talk. I also feel that because these days, investigative reporting has become something like being born again. Apologies to non-Christians of this forum. In the past, people could hardly come out and say they were born again. Now, every time people go to nightclubs, they come out and say, I'm born again. And that's what investigative reporting has become. Almost everybody is an investigative journalist. But you can't be an investigative journalist and be frolicking with the people you are supposed to cover. I, I see investigative journalists who, you know, spend time, VC, money bags. You, 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 can't, you can't be on the fence. You can't be for us and then also be for them. You have to be as distant as possible from the people you, you are covering. Again, the investigative um, journalists have to spot when they are being used. You know, I spent time in a proper traditional newsroom before coming online. So when people bring stories to me, one of the first, 
one question that often throws them aback when I ask is, why are you bringing this story? What's your interest? Why are you interested in this story? There has to be something prompting you to reach out to me. And especially in this political season, you have, for, for, for instance, a Reno Omokri, former um, spokesman of the PDP president, going to Twitter to publicly say that I am inviting an investigative journalist to come and travel to the US to find out about the APC candidate's education, and I will fund that trip, you know? You know, and you accept that as an investigative journalist, even though it's a valid story. The reality is that he who pays the piper calls the tune, and then at that point in time, you are a pawn in the hands of politicians. A political party is using you as an investigative journalist to land an uppercut on the other party. So it's not just about the story, the telling of the story, it's also about not fraternizing with people we are covering. And that caution to make sure you are not, you know, turning yourself into a tool uh, with which political fight, political, political parties are fighting one another. Thank you. I'm the first person who wasn't stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Fisa. You are short, sharp, and sweet. Um, so I'll turn next to, to you, Adora, um, because you focus on amplifying marginalized voices, you know, at the grassroots, you know, women, and very typically these, uh, these voices tend to be pushed to subnational media, if that at all. So what more can we do to elevate um, and expand the spaces for these voices within subnational media? All right, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and um, good afternoon to everyone. I want to also say happy birthday to Professor Wale Shorinka. Um, and I'll start first with a quote that I'm very familiar, familiar with one of his quotes. And he says, the greatest threat to freedom is the absence of criticism. And that's by Professor uh, Wale Shorinka. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think it's very critical, especially now in our nation's lifespan. And I, I want to just touch a bit on, you know, the obligation of the media, if I may. Um, I listened to uh, Dr. Lydie and I also listened to Dr. Um, Schneider uh, earlier on, and she talked about what democracy was. And I think the first thing I take away from that is where she mentioned everyday lived experiences and realities of citizens. And when you talk about citizens in inverted comma, it means across board. It means persons living with disability, it means women, it means youth, and of course it means elder persons as well. And um, Dr. Lyder talked about the nexus of course, the connection between the media and the government and the role of the policy making body like such as NBC. But the obligation of the media as indicated in the section 22 of the 1999 constitution is first to discharge the duty of a watchdog in all aspects of the governance and in guarding and advancing the frontiers of persons liberties and freedom and also to serve as the policing institution over the fundamental objectiveness and direct principles of state policy, as well as citizens' fundamental rights. And I come to where the issue of fundamental rights is very important, which is part of the question. Um, the rising in lack of inclusion and the rising lack of voices for women, persons with disabilities at a subnational level, I can tell this as a result of what has earlier been mentioned, the centered conversation of some of these issues just at the subnational level without bridging the gap between them and the policymakers. And I can tell you that one of the most important thing in expanding that phase is to encourage collaboration and collaboration between those at the subnational level and those at the center. I have for over 14 years been in the media space and some of my strongest strengths has been working in the gender space. I anchor and produce Gender Agenda, the only policy literacy program on national television and is live. And one of the things and I noticed and challenges that I did see was lack of policy literacy for the women at the community level. Now they have challenges, but they do not understand the challenges and their rights within those challenges. And that is where the media comes in, to be able to articulate those issues, expand those conversations, and bridge the gap between execution and implementation. So I believe that one thing is first, the ability to step down literacy on some of those issues, that women's rights and you know, persons with disability rights are also human rights. And once they are able to understand that and look at the fact that 
ownership of those conversations are also in, as important as it is with them, as much as it is at the center. So uh, the media in, in, in broad spectrum, for me, I am very passionate that community journalism is the only way forward in expanding the voices of these marginalized groups at those levels, and then collaborating with those at the institutions to be able to bridge the gap between the policymakers and women and those people at, at the subnational level. The policies that we have, the equal opportunity for, for women and persons with disabilities, the gender policies that we have, unfortunately, are there. But who understands them? How are they being articulated? And even when we try to step down those conversations, you have a brick wall where people do not even understand their rights within those conversations. Um, recently, we saw the gender bills that were stepped down. Of course, the, <laughs> some of the ministers that were recently appointed had no female in them. And nobody is asking questions. And even the little voices that are asking do not understand what the impediments of those choices are in the larger perspective for those women and those persons living at the community level. So where you have a smaller space for women's voices, women's rights, persons with disability, and even young persons within those spaces marginalized, you probably have a short end conversation that does not have as an expansive execution as possible because there is no leaning on the, on the smaller voices at the subnational. So I think that for democracy to work, because for me, first of all, is the, is the agenda of the conversation here, democracy. Can democracy work at the subnational level without, you know, the media, especially at the subnational level? The answer is no. And if you have those um, um, those those numbers of people, those categories of persons excluded within this conversation, you're already talking about disenfranchising some members of the population whose voices are critical and are the most vulnerable. And so the idea of democracy. For, of the people, uh, for the people by the people. I think that I hear democracy as just the system, but the media as the tool to push democracy to the forefront. And the only way democracy can be complete is if everybody in the society has a voice and the media's role is to amplify the voices of those people that are most vulnerable at those level. The subnational, you, you, you talk about you know, media sustainability and you know, funding. It is very severe at the subnational level. Very, very severe. You have limited funds for state you know, newspapers. You have limited funds and remuneration of you know, journalists at the local level. They are unable to carry through you know, investigations because of one, protection of lives and properties, insecurity, lack of access, lack of equipment, you know, um, lack of capacity building. And these are the areas that we can actually look at expanding some of those, you know, collaboration for those at the subnational level to look at these persons who are within the media cadre to be able to look at issues as it concerns the vulnerable group. In the absence of that, the only thing that we can continue to continue to do to maximize the voices of these persons is, like I said earlier, to be able to step down collaboration. And that is why I think that the launch of this project is very effective and very timely because we are at a at a placement in the history of our country where the role of Nigeria as an, an equal society is very, very slim. Where we have the population disenfranchised, where we have, you know, almost 79% of women in the labor market, but have the minimalist you know, budget in terms of when it comes to gender budgeting. So these are issues that are critical. And I think that community journalism, collaboration, stepping down those engagements and having to sustain these conversations through bridging the gap between those at the subnational level and the policymakers at the center is really critical. Thank you, Adora. Look, um, um, participants, let me remind you that if you have questions, I can see that the chat is quite vibrant, um, but it's so vibrant that I'm losing questions. So if, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, box so we can get them uh, addressed. And on that note, um, I, I want to pick up Adora on, on what you said about, you know, Nigeria and its responsibility to uh, Nigerians. And um, sitting on the eastern side of Africa, I'd also, you know, beg to submit that Nigeria has this responsibility to Africans. Most of you will be familiar with the adage that where Nigeria goes, Africa follows. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be people looking, you know, because everything we're discussing here, um, 
uh, applies not just to Nigeria, but it applies across the continent. Um, state capture of media, um, harassment of journalists, you know, poor conditions for journalists, it is taking place um, across the continent. And there's a real opportunity here for Nigeria to show leadership, not just, um, you know, in terms of entertainment in Nollywood, but also in terms of the vibrancy um, of its media, because you recall that Nigeria was one of the countries, um, the first countries in Africa to, um, to, to start with, with the media, Mauritius, South Africa, and then Nigeria. These are the countries that um, started um, the first newspapers on the continent. And so I'll challenge um, Nigerians to um, do better, um, not just for Nigerians, but, but for the rest of the continent. Now, Mansoor, do we have you with us? Yes, Mansoor with us? Yes. Or you yes. Off? yes. Hello, Mansoor. Hello, hi. It's great to, I'm very well, thank you. It's great to uh, reconnect with you after so long. And so you've quit the BBC as I did, and you are now a big man at the Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria. And so my question for you, Mansoor, is, is one that also applies to the rest of the continent. Very often public, um, media is corrupted and perverted to the cause of state media. And I know you understand the distinction. How do you strike the balance between your allegiance to government, the state which pays you, um, and, as your, as a, and your role as a watchdog in the public interest? Thank you very much, uh, Uduak. Uh, first of all, I want to say happy birthday to Professor Wole Shoyunka. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, first of all, to unite with my former colleague Uduak virtually, and then to, to contribute my own, um, I mean, to make my contributions on the present discussion that is taking place. Indeed, I think uh, public media anywhere in Africa find themselves in a very difficult situation because First of all, I think is the lack of understanding by government officials of the role of the public media itself. Uh, as uh, one of the discussions have said, the role of a media is to act as, as a watchdog, whether it's public or whether it's private. I think that is the constitutional role that is given to the media. But unfortunately, you have a situation whereby government officials think that the public media is there to do their own bidding. But unfortunately, it's not. I think it's a media that is supposed to, to, to do its own constitutional role. So it's a delicate balance that one, as uh, I mean, heading an organization that is public, that has to, to, to actually do. Uh, first of all, being a journalist, I mean, all my career, if there's anything that comes out, I will not in any way try to censor my own journalists. And uh, I think uh, any anybody is free to go and find out from the staff that are working with me, whether they have been censored or not. I think the situation is really, uh, I mean, I am in a very probably comfortable position in the sense that there is less interference, I mean, during this particular administration. And when I say less interference, I mean, from the top level, of the government, there is a less interference uh, in, in the activities of the media, especially public media. So it really depends on what the organization and the staff of organization actually try to do. Uh, I've been in this role for the past six years. Uh, believe me, Uduak and uh, the rest of the panelists and actually the rest of the participants, nobody has passed a paper to me to say that I should not cover a particular story. Now, what I find out coming from the BBC is that because people in the public media have been here for ages, they self-censor themselves. So it's a very difficult situation to actually try to tell them that, look, you are free to actually push the boundary. Uh, and this is what I'm trying to do, to make sure that people actually can push the boundary and see what happens. Because insofar as you are objective, you are accurate in what you do. I think it's very hard for any government official to actually come out to say what you're saying is false. I think the issue is that the journalists themselves, they, they self-censor themselves. They think that there are issues that are untouchable and uh, so, so they, they don't go out to, to, to do it. But of course, again, if you look at the situation uh, uh, of, 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 I mean, people that are working, the 
the conditions of working, I think actually makes it again, very difficult for them to, to, to touch uh, issues. What I mean by this is that you have a journalist that is scrambling to be uh, posted to a particular ministry, uh, probably because of the things that they get uh, beside uh, what they are going to do. So if that particular journalist is scrambling to be sent to that ministry, you know that when you send that person, he's not going to perform the job that, that, that you want him to perform. So it's the condition of service, I think, that actually uh, makes matters worse because they go in, uh, because of what they get, they tend not to, 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 to report the, the, the issues that are supposed to be, to, be, to, be, to be reported. So I think we need to do a lot of job, like one of the other panelists that has said, I think it's an issue of capacity. Uh, I think we need to, to work very hard on, on our journalists to actually so that they recognize their role in doing things, whether you're public or you're private or you're, you're, you're whatever, I think the constitutional role is one. It is the same. Of course, you have been paid by the, I mean, the public media has been paid by the government, but the government is its own responsibility to pay and so that we get the service because uh, information is part and parcel of a, it's a fundamental human rights and everybody in Nigeria or anywhere, the government has a responsibility to find a way uh, whether to create the conditions for the public media to get its own finances, or if they don't do that, then they have to 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 give the the finances. But of course, again, uh, the the finances that are, are are given, I think, are not enough for the media to conduct certain issues. If I want to do an investigative journalism now, which will probably take, I mean, thousands of dollars, is very hard for the government to finance that. That is another issue. Uh, that, that we're facing. And for the private donors, it's very hard for them to actually finance public uh, media, thinking that that public media is working for, for the government. But really, I think it's, it's, it's actually a matter of people to understand that given the right leadership, I think the public media can actually work the way it's supposed to work. But it's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I appeal for training with, on, on the journalists. And then, of course, we are working very hard to make sure that the conditions of service is improved so that people can deliver what they are supposed to, to, to deliver. OK, thank you, Mansoor. Um, that was fairly comprehensive. But the question's coming in. Um, Fisayo, I'll start with you just because there are two questions for you. Um, and I negotiated extra time. So panelists, I'd encourage you to be as succinct as possible so that we can get as many questions as possible um, answered. Fisayo, your questions are related. One from Juliana. How then do you balance your reports if you're distancing yourself um, from those you're investigating. And then um, from Salisu, uh, also for you, Fisayo, how can one be an investigative journalist and perform independent investigations without third party funding um, your work? Sorry, I didn't quite get the second, without the last few sentences of the second question. Of the second question, how can you do your investigative work without um, funding from external parties? Okay, without external funding. Okay. Without so external funding, question, yes. You don't need to, you don't you don't you don't need to be friends with people to balance your work. You don't something's happened with your audio, you're not as clear as you were earlier. Only... Oh, okay. Um let me let me move my airports. Right, right. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. So you can you can reach out to people without necessarily being friends with them. You know, you don't have the, you don't need a relationship with people before you call them to 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 react to your story. You only need to source their phone numbers when you need to speak with them, their email contacts, um, social media contacts, if there are people who are active on, on social media. But you don't need the relationship with people to reach out to them as a journalist to respond to a story. There is no, there is no, there is no correlation. That's one. Two, um, how can you do investigative stories without funding from external sources. Number one is that there are quite a lot of stories that can be done that are not cost intensive. There are quite a number. You know, the, 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 
the trick is always to look for stories that require access. You know, if you are just starting out or you are struggling with, 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 with fonts, the trick is always stories that really need access for them to be done. Um, not stories that require a lot of travel. You know, other than that, there is really no, no way around getting fun. Well, you're encouraging, you know, being strategic in the, in the story selection. Cut your, 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 choose your stories according to your um, funding. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Ibiba, I'm going to direct this question um, from Pauline to you. Um, talking about community journalism, how do we go about it, bearing in mind that there is a lot of insecurity going on in the country? I practice in the Niger Delta and there um, are particles, pockets, I, I guess, of insecurity going on, kidnapping and all that. But, you know, all of that is not limited to the Niger Delta. How, how do you, you know, ensure that your journalists are safe, that you are safe, Ibiba? Okay, uh, thank you. One of, one of the things uh, that we do, we, ha we had a training when we first started in April, before we started um, the investigative reports, we did training and as somebody who, cover, who was covered in uh, Niger Delta for 20 something years, I was able to share experiences not, uh, we always say knowledge is power. Be clear about what the local realities are. You, you must have your, your, your contacts. I've always only gone to uh, communities from when I was at the Guardian and today running uh, my own um, 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 newspaper and the partnership. We, uh, we go to community based on information. And you have to be clear. I know that, yes, you have to do a lot of research, get clear um, about what you're going to do what the uh, local realities are, who are the armed people, what's happening at that very time. I have walked into uh, situations of um, out and out conflicts, but that was way back when the Niger Delta wasn't as dangerous as, as it is. I, I'm not going to um, make, make little of your concerns, Paul, uh, Pauline. We, are, we, we live in the Niger Delta. We know what happens. People have been killed. I don't know if uh, some of you saw the viral video of somebody who was uh, were kidnapped and put, um, you know, in a dog out uh, grave with water and all of that, with a, a cellophane bag over his head. Those are the realities. But still, it is possible because some of those acts are carried out by known people in the communities. And actually, they target some of the people they target are politicians who used to fund them um, and abandon them. But I'm not saying that anybody cannot be victim, uh, victimized. People have been killed. You know, prominent people, traditional rulers. A, a commissioner for uh, commissioner in Bielsa was kidnapped because he uh, vehemently opposed the setting up of a, um, a coal fire that's artisanal refining uh, setup in his community. The uh, state government had to step in. So the point I'm making is awareness. You have to do your research. You have to know what you're going into and take necessary uh, precautions and also be careful if there, if it's a divided community, you have to be clear that everybody knows that you're uh, just a journalist going about your, your business. It's not easy, but so far, at least uh, we've not had too many incidents of journalists being uh, kidnapped. So Thank you, Ibiba. There's a question here from Dennis. Nigerian journalists are faced with problems of poor remuneration and having delayed salaries across media organizations. How do you galvanize community media owners to ensure prompt payment of salaries and by extension funding investigative efforts of journalists. Um, that question, uh, <laughs> that issue is not uh, confined to Nigerian journalists alone. Um, Haruna, I will put that question to you, given that you um, are, you know, fairly senior in your organization. How do you deal with, you know, owners and their weak commitment to timely uh, salary payments? Well, I, I, I will be very honest on this. Uh, prior to the grants we currently run, we equally don't pay salaries. So what I usually do basically is to train my journalists in such a way that they'll be able to look for independent funding somewhere. So that was why I keep reiterating about capacity. 
if the newsroom does not have the funding, for example, to pay salaries and bankroll journalists to go and do independent journalism, you should be able to give them that capacity, that training, that commensurate knowledge to be able to look for funding themselves, right? So for me, that is uh, a better alternative for smaller newsrooms such as ours. But for the bigger newsrooms that are government funded or well-established national dailies or, or, or well-established private institution, uh, I think they are in the better position to, to respond to that question. But again, I, I, I wanted to add a little bit to what Fisher raised the other time about, uh, you know, the people not well informed as to the kind of services they should ask and who they should ask and how, where, where they should uh, look for, uh, you know, in their effort to demand for better services. Fisher is quite right about that. But again, at the heart of that argument still lies the capacity of the media. Do the media have the capacity? Do they have the courage? Do they have the competence yeah. to even educate the people on what we have to look for? I mean, we, we, we have to ask questions. Uh, Professor Wanko talked about unlimited questions in the other time. Do we have the capacity to consistently keep asking questions, to consistently keep demanding for accountability from our leaders and all that? That is, that is the issue. Do we have that capacity? Do we have that courage? Do you have that competence? I will give you several examples. At Wiki time, Actually, sometimes we have know, one example. Hand. We're out of time. One, one, yeah. one example. Quickly, at, at Wiki time, sometimes uh, the kind of journalism we do at the grassroots level tend to suggest that when you have a vibrant media at the local level, more than likely you are going to make an impact and be able to hold people to account. We wrote, a, we did a story just this year that got a local government chairman suspended. We went to Yobe, where Ahmed Lawal, the Senate president hails from, did a story in hatch to rich areas, communities ordinarily you wouldn't want to go because of insurgency and all that. And we were able to document monumental corruption where these guys at Abuja, at the National Assembly, keep on eating in the name of the people. They keep on getting huge money in releasing and allocation, but at the end of the day, they will loot the resources and believe that no media personnel will go out to look for this issue and be able to hold power to account. Okay, Haruna, thank you. Um, you know, we're frustrated everywhere, wherever we are as Africans, we're frustrated. Um, there should be um, popping up a quick feedback form, um, um, you know, on the chat screens for you to um, share your feedback uh, with the WSCIJ. Um, but unfortunately, we have to stop the Q&A now. This is a rich conversation, a big conversation. Um, this will not be the start of it. This will not be the end of it. There is so much more um, to, to, to share about this, but unfortunately, our time has come to an end. I would encourage you um, through the good offices of Motun Rayo and her staff to continue talking about this on this end. In Kenya, we're dealing um, with, with these questions as well. So my hope in doing this is that there will, we can build synergies across the uh, um, continent. But for now, I'd like to thank our panelists um, and our speakers, because you've been both brilliant and generous with your insights. Top of mind for me really was the breakdown of the role between democracy and the media, and then the practical experiences, which, you know, as, as unfortunate as they are, are not unique to Nigeria. Um, but we also had, um, and we've heard some very concrete examples of how you can navigate some of these challenges from Chisayo, um, picking stories that don't need too much travel. And um, from Dayo, it's, 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 you know, getting, um, citizens, you know, paying, investing in their own local media. We've had lots and lots of, of, of suggestions, low-hanging fruit here, which I hope that we can take away and begin to put in practice. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you um, share your appreciation um, for our panelists and speakers, Dr. Woko Chedo, Woko um, Dayo um, Olaide, um, and Suleiman Adora Onyechere, Fisayo Soyombo, Haruna Muhammad, and Abiba Don Pedro. Thank you very much for your time and your um, generosity with us today. So to send us all on our way, I'd like to invite the chairman of the board of the WSCIJ, Professor Shikoni, um, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. 
Well, I, um, I feel really very privileged to be asked to do this. I haven't come late so noticeably for technical reasons on my side. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you have been with us for more than a decade now. Uh, and this is, in fact, the first time I am attending this lecture uh, online, you know, an indication of uh, the many health challenges around. But despite those challenges, I've been able to see many of the faces that I've always seen, and at the same time, those that I've not even seen before, or an indication to me that uh, the USIJ is trying to meet some of our communication needs. And I thank you very much uh, for taking time out of no time, risking all the issues of traffic in Lagos or elsewhere to be with us today. And uh, I so much want it on record that uh, after I'm starting with thanking everybody that has shown up today. And in addition, I want to thank our speakers oh, from the little that I've been privileged to, to see. I, I have been noticeably educated myself about the problems facing us. Uh, at the corporate level, we don't have enough money to do the job of a watchdog. Even uh, at the private level, many of us are at the risk of training journalists to look for money first to be able to do their own job. You know. There's, there's no more way to abuse any profession than this. So, but I thank all of you for, for coming out to give us uh, a, a real, I used to call this today a, a day for festival of ideas. And despite all the challenges of the moment, I'm, I'm glad that we still have experienced a lot of such intellectual festivals today. I thank you all for coming and wish you safe journey back home. Thank you, Professor Sekoni. My name is Udua Kamimo. I'm your sister on the Kenyan side, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this conversation, um, you know, about my other half and, and it's, uh, you know, uh, fate. I checked out of the media after becoming quite jaded and cynical. And conversations like this, you know, um, you know, you, you know, plant a glimmer of hope that all is not lost. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Motun Royal um, Alaka and her team, Samson and others at the Iwolui uh, Shoyinka Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, I want to wish you all well and congratulate uh, once again on the launch of C Media. And let's go out and do great things. Um, we are important as media pr practitioners. Let's not forget that. Thank you very much. Have a good day.